tonight they said, Nick, why don't you talk about the Holy Spirit? Which is like saying, you know, hey, Jimmy Cricket, why don't you tell us how the world goes around? So we're going to figure this out. Um, this isn't... This isn't a comprehensive look at the Holy Spirit. Um, one, because he's God, and so figuring him, you know, you couldn't, you could never be comprehensive. And number two, frankly, because, I don't know, I'm not going to throw like a baby chick off the cliff and make it fly. So we're just going to give you sort of the basics of the Holy Spirit. And then as you grow in your faith, then you can feel free to explore, you know, other avenues of the Holy Spirit so you can get to know it all. And I didn't read your chapter in the book. So, don't think that this comes from that. This comes from seminary, though. Like, those people, they know. Okay, let's see. This is the Holy Spirit. This is in uh, St. Peter's Basilica. This is behind the throne of the Pope. And that's the Holy Spirit in the center, the little tiny dove. And then you have all these angels. I don't know if you can see them, but all the angels, and they're all going, ooh, ah. And, I don't know, I guess that's what heaven's like. Everyone's going, ooh, and ah. And, uh... Yeah, there you go. So, the Trinity. Because you can't understand the Holy Spirit without understanding the Trinity. And because this is a Catholic church, we decided to pull the Latin graphic on you. Uh, so, what it basically says is, it says the Father, Pater, is known as Filius, is not the Son. And Pater, known as Spiritus, and the Father is not the Spirit. But then don't forget that the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father and not the Son. But the Father, est Deus, is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. All right, we're all together on this one. And together they are holy, holy, holy. That's the Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. All right, so everyone's an expert now, right? Y'all don't need me anymore. Y'all know the Trinity. All right, well, I actually had an entire class on Trinity, and my professor, who's a priest of like 45 years and he studied in Rome and Jerusalem. He has like 500 letters after his name. He explained the Trinity and so I wanted to read this so that I wouldn't screw it up with my bad English. All right, so it says, the Father loves the Son eternally and that is called kenosis. Kenosis is a total giving love. You give your entire being. You don't just give half of yourself or most of yourself. You give all of it. So the Father gives his entire being to the Son. So pater all the way over to the Filius. And then Jesus, the Son, comes to reveal the Father. He comes to us and he reveals us the Father. Because the Father is sort of a little less tangible because Jesus was a man, right? He was a God-man. He was fully God, fully man. Did y'all cover Jesus last week? Oh, then you know. Okay. So, the Father is a boundless source of self-gift, which means there's no limit to this love that he gives to the Son. He's emptying himself 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, for eternity. There's, it's, there's no time, so it's forever, and it's as much as there ever can be. So that's pretty big. And then it says, the Father exists in begetting the Son, which means the Son is generated by the Father because the Father wants to give this love, and this love has to be given somewhere. And so it's given to the Son. Now the reason why the Father depends on the Son is because if you didn't have the second person of the Trinity, you wouldn't have the first person of the Trinity, because God the Father can't be a father unless he's got a son. I guess he could have had a daughter, but no, he had a son. That's just the way it worked. All right, now if we're confusing you, don't worry. It took, you know, several thousands of years of people arguing to figure this one out. So it says, the son exists in his receptivity to the father. So the son exists entirely to take all this love that God the Father is throwing out. So God the Father, do we have a, all right, does anybody, anybody on like the team know if we have that dry erase marker board? Because I have a really cool graphic I could draw to make sure that nobody gets off. Could someone get that for me? Thank you, Buck. Okay. Should we wait? It's a really awesome graphic. I didn't come up with it. This teacher did. Okay. Don't want to hit Skippy. 
Okay. So here we go. So here we have God the Father. And he's emptying himself to God the Son. Okay? So he's emptying himself to God the Son. So God the Son is receiving all this love. It's just coming his way. And he's saying, oh, this is great stuff. So then God the Son takes all of his love, which again is all the love that comes from the Father, and he gives it back to the Father. So I'll tell you how I explained it to the second graders. I won't, I won't ask for volunteers because adults won't be silly like second graders. But God the Father is eternally saying to God the Son, I love you. 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 It goes on forever. So God the Son receives all that love, all that I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then he gives it back and he says, I love you too, 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 I love you too. Right? Do we need volunteers yet? No? Okay. So, in this receptivity of love, this sort of, it's called the, uh, Oh, hold on a second. It's a Greek word. Yeah, I knew I knew it. The perichoresis. Oh, there you go. Perichoresis. And basically, it means like the eternal love dance. Because that's basically what it is. It's this dance between the Father and the Son of love. Just taking love and giving love, and it's 100%. So it's kind of weird. But then in this love generates the Holy Spirit. Well, he's bigger in this instance. All right, so the Holy Spirit is generated by these two. Now, generated does not mean created. It doesn't mean that there was a time when Jesus was not, and there was a time when there was no Holy Spirit. Because this happens eternally. So, basically, how to put it. We live sort of in a timeline, right? So when I explain this, I have to say, it starts here, then goes here, and then comes here. But in reality, because it's eternal outside of time, this all happens all at once forever. So, who's last? Okay, as long as I'm the only one. Now, the Holy Spirit, then, the Holy Spirit, he kind of says like, we love each other, 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 all right? Because he's the, he's the fruition. He's what bears fruit. Because, you know, when there's love, love produces something, right? So when a husband and a wife, when they love each other, you know, babies come. And so that's, that's actually a very good sort of example of a Trinitine type thing, you know? You have the husband who loves the wife, the wife who loves the husband, and together in their love they have a child, and then that child goes out and shares that love to the world. Same thing here, is that the Father and the Son love each other, and then the Holy Spirit, who we're talking about today, He's really sent out to share that love with everybody, including all of us. So, that's awesome. And we'll leave that there. So, let's see. Yeah, there you go. We're going to move on because I think I just confused <coughs> me. All right, so I figured now that we did all of that sort of brain work, we do something a little less brainiac, which is in the creed, right? The early church develops this Nicene Creed at the Council of Nicaea. And basically, the, church, or the early church had a lot of heresies in it because people were trying to figure this Jesus thing out. And so, the church said, you know what we're going to do? That's not me. They said, we are going to make a statement of faith that all Christians are going to agree on. So all the bishops got together and all the theologians, and they said, well, what do we know about God? What do we know about Jesus Christ? What do we know about the Holy Spirit? So we're going to go over those few phrases about the Holy Spirit. Because who's, who has said or read the Nicene Creed? Okay, the majority of you. Basically, it's got this long part about God the Father, and then this long part about God the Son, and it's got this light, tiny little thing about God the Holy Spirit. So we're going to go over what those few lines mean. 
Okay, so let's start with, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. So, we start off with saying we believe that there is a Holy Spirit, that there is this third person to the Trinity, and then we believe that he's the Lord. It's a capital L. So, in the Hebrew, it's Elohim, which is the word for Lord, which is reserved for God alone. So, we believe that he is God. So, he's not sort of God's pet bird, and he's not, you know, God's little buddy, and he's not subservient to God the Father. It's not like he's God the Father's little, you know, page or something, and he says, hey, go deliver this message to, you know, Ezekiel or Moses or something. All right? He is equal with the Father and the Son. That's an important one, because that was an early heresy, that God the Father was superior to God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Not true. They're equals. All right? But things start with the Father and proceed through the, through the Son and the Holy Spirit. But still God. Okay? And then we say he's the giver of life. And we often think, we often think of God the Father as the giver of life, because in the creation story in Genesis... It says, and then God spoke, and then he saw it was good, right? But if you look, the second, this is not the New American Bible uh, version, because I didn't like that translation, but the Jerusalem Bible, which is an older translation, I like it. And if you're going to use the King James, which is incomplete, that has a very good uh, translation as well. But if you look at Genesis 1, verse 2, it says, when the water has been created, it says, and God's spirit hovered over the water. So God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is there at creation helping create. In fact, in creation, the Trinity is there. Because God the Father is there willing the world to be made. And then when God speaks, who's his word? The word of God is the second person of the Trinity, you know, which we know as Jesus Christ. I'm standing in front of this. And then the Spirit hovers. And then... When God forms Adam out of clay, right, in 2-7, uh, there you go, I wrote it down because I knew I was going to forget it. It says, and then he breathed into his nostrils. I know it's kind of gross, but he did it. He breathed into him his spirit, and it gave him life. So that's what gave man life, was the Holy Spirit. It, was, it wasn't necessarily God the Father saying, boom, you have life. It's God the Father saying, here's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit says, off I go. All right, so he gives life. We see this also for ourselves as Christians, or soon-to-be Christians, in the Holy Spirit coming at baptism. At Jesus' baptism, that's really when life begins for a Christian, because there's death and a new life begins. So the Holy Spirit not only brings us physical life, but he also brings us spiritual life. And then, of course, at Pentecost, he brings life to the church. Because Jesus Christ founds the church when he says to Peter, you are Petrus, you are rock, and upon this rock I shall found my church. But then, where was his church after his resurrection? They were cowering in a locked room, afraid that people were going to come and take him away. So the Holy Spirit comes and says, well, let's give some life to this party. And he comes down, you know, Jesus comes, breathes some tongues of fire, which is the Holy Spirit, and boom! Boom! They're out there, they're speaking in tongues, and they're doing miracles, and everybody's saying, hey, Jesus was an awesome guy. So he gives life, not only to us physically and spiritually, but also to the church. And it's interesting to note that this life that we have, either spiritual, you know, ecclesiastical, which means church life, or even physical life, would end if the Holy Spirit chose to end it. If God the Father chose to end it. Because God the Father, oh, here we go, back to the board. If God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, if they're constantly in this love dance, and they're sharing the love dance with us, right? That's what keeps us alive. If God were to forget about us for even a split second, we'd disappear. And it wouldn't be like people would say, hey, where'd Father McDonald go? We would just never know that Father McDonald existed. And Father Justin would be the pastor. And that's a happy thought, I suppose, for some. Wait, that was mean. Don't record that. <laughs> Anyhow, moving on. We got it on camera. I know, right? <laughs> so over here we have, this is a nice picture. I love Catholic art. Can I say that? That's why I do PowerPoints, just because there's, some, there's such good Catholic art out there. There's crappy, can I say that? Yeah, there's no children here. There's crappy Catholic art out there, but there's really good stuff. And so I said, well, you know what? I'll do some good stuff. 
And this is sort of, this is the only one I could find where like the Holy Spirit was all by himself. You know, and all the little cherubim, the little naked baby angels are like, hey, Holy Spirit, he's flying through. And he's like flying through this cloud and it's very awesome. Except this one at the bottom, it looks like he's trying to get out of the way. All right. So the next line. Who proceeds from the Father and the Son. Oh, we're going to have a field day with this one. Okay. So basically, the Holy Spirit, while being equal with the Father and the Son, desires to do the will of God, the unified God, completely. So God the Father, all the will starts with God the Father, goes to God the Son, and then comes down through the Holy Spirit. So, for instance, we're going to say the baptism of Jesus. God the Father says, let's sanctify this baptism. Because up until then, all the baptisms that John is doing, right? John the Baptist, he's over in the Jordan, he's baptizing people. And he's just baptizing people. And he's like, oh, here's some water. Here's some water. Here's some water. Right? And he says, but the one who's coming after me is going to baptize with water and the Holy Spirit. We're going to get some Holy Spirit in here. But for now, he doesn't. Now, the baptisms of John that he's doing up until this point, do they count as a baptism? Ooh, show of hands. Oh, let's take a survey. Theology by, by democracy. Okay, who thinks that all of the baptisms John the Baptist did were actual baptisms? Yes. Yes, hands. Up. And, okay, no hands. Where are the no hands? Okay, I got one. You're a winner, Mark. It's true. Because in Acts, if you read the book of Acts, some of the followers of John come up to the disciples, the new apostles, and they say, hey, I hear you guys are baptizing. Well, we were baptized by John. That counts, right? And the apostles say, well, no, because you weren't baptized with the Holy Spirit. You were just baptized with water. You need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they said, oh, well, we got to go back to the river? And they said, yeah, go back to the river. And they said, okay, good stuff. So that's what happened. So here, though, do you have a question? I, do. I have a question segment at the end. Can it wait? Um, no, no, if it's really important, if you're going to like fall out because I'll you don't get this down. answer. Thank you, because I would forget it too. Because I, I don't know, did I tell you all that I'm a talker? And if I answer questions during my thing, I get off topic. And before long, we're talking about my childhood obsession with Legos. <laughs> so, do you want to talk about that? No, let's not. What was I saying? Oh, okay, yeah, here we go. All right, so at the baptism of Jesus, God the Father says, all right, let's sanctify this. So he sends the Holy Spirit down. And of course, the, uh, the heavens are ripped open. That's what it says. It doesn't say in the Bible, in the Greek, which the gospel was written in, it doesn't say, you know, the heavens were opened. It says the heavens were ripped open. The heavens were torn open, which is an actual awesome thing. But that's for a different discussion. Ask me later about that. But anyhow, so then the Holy Spirit comes down. And what does he come down as? but a dove. And I mean, we have picked a wussier little animal. I mean, he's not even like a bald eagle or, you know, something awesome. He's like this little tiny dove of peace and happiness. So people kind of think that the Holy Spirit is sort of like this little tiny thing and it's not really important, but he's really important because that's what makes the baptism of Jesus so, you know, powerful, so sanctifying. That's what really starts Jesus's ministry. So, it's not necessarily the will of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is doing the will of the Father. So the Holy Spirit proceeds through the Father. And then, if you look at Pentecost, which is the opposite one, Jesus Christ is the one who sends the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is through Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit comes down to his disciples and to his mom and makes them into apostles and, I don't know, Mary's the super apostle, I guess. And... You know, that's what really gets them going with the church. Now, for all of you Bible scholars, not Bible scholars, church history scholars, the question is, and I haven't even separated it here, and the Son. Because the original Nicene Creed, which was written, said, who proceeds through the fa uh, from the Father. All right? It did not say from the Father and the Son. But people believed that it came from the Father and the Son. But they didn't write it down because there was some debate at the time of, does it come from the Son or through the Son? And so they just left it out because they said, well, we don't have time to bicker about this tiny little point. We've got, you know, a document of, of you know, faith to put out. 
Well, what happened was that in the West, in Western Europe, where the Pope lives, there was a heresy called the Sabellianists who said, see, we knew that Jesus Christ had nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ were totally separated. And the only thing that unites them is the Father. And so the church had to say, no, you're wrong. They're intimately connected. Because each time you turn around in the, in the mission of Christ, you know, on earth, there's always the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's coming along. The Holy Spirit's the one that helps heal people. You know, everything has to do with the Holy Spirit as well. And they said, no, 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 no. Pope, you're wrong. And so the Pope said, well, we got to get rid of this idea. So he calls this council in France, and they get together and they say, you know what, we'll add in this little Latin phrase called, it's called filioque, which means and the son. And he says, we're just going to tack that on to the creed. So they did it. And of course, the Eastern churches said, you can't do that. You can't just decide by yourself, you know, Mr. Pope, to add something into the creed. And of course, the Pope said, well, I am the Pope. And so we did, you know, we are going to do it. And they said, but you didn't invite us to come and argue about it. And he said, well, we don't really have time to argue. We have people who are, you know, going to hell because they're believing something that's stupid. And they said, well, you know what? We're mad about this. And he said, fine, be mad, but we're dealing with it. And so then we basically got into a big old fight. And well, that wasn't that great. But nowadays, just in 2001, we agreed that it wasn't necessarily that big of a point. But what's important to understand is that the East and the West actually kind of believed the same thing. We just were arguing about wording, which I think is silly. And actually, nowadays, we think is silly. This heresy was 1050, or when was it? No, this heresy was back in the three, four, five hundreds. Yeah, oh, well, it was early. Not the earliest, but it was pretty early. OK, let's see. That's why there were two councils of Nicaea to deal with this page. ended up with a second one, which we already talked about. Awesome. Okay, now, the next line is, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. And you might not actually know that. You might not actually realize that that's actually the case. A lot of times, the Holy Spirit sort of becomes the forgotten God. He's sort of like, everyone's all about Jesus. You know, they're all about Jesus. Uh, we're all in Jesus. And then, you know, you have people and they pray, they say, Father God, Father God, do this for us. But very few, I mean... Very few are saying, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Now there are, there's a movement now. There are different things. There, there's the charismatic movement, which we're not going to get into. If you're charismatic, that's your business. That's fine. And we can talk about it later, but we're not going to get into it now. And if you don't know what charismatic is, don't ask me. All right? That's just the thing. And everybody who laughed understands what I mean. Okay. So, a lot of times they say, oh, you have the Holy Spirit. Because, you know, it's like, Look at this picture, all right? You have all these bishops and popes and holy men and women and all the martyrs over on the left-hand side and all the angels above, and they're all worshiping God. And so you have this humongous God the Father with this big old crown, and he's holding up humongous God the Son on his cross, and then that tiny little dove right above, see? He doesn't get center, he doesn't get center booking. He's a tiny little thing, almost like an afterthought. So a lot, it's kind of easy to forget about the Holy Spirit. But I have a priest at the seminary, he's a Nigerian, and he says in his Mass, he says that the, Holy, that the Holy Trinity is undivided in splendor. So, if you say, God the Father, you're awesome, you might also want to remind yourself that what's done with God the Father's will is done through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. So you might want to give the Holy Spirit some credit too, all right? Like, if you, if you missed, you know, if, if you didn't die in that plane crash, don't just be saying, oh, thank you, Jesus, thank you. You know, because the Holy Spirit's kind of sitting there going, well, I helped, you know? <laughs> so, let's see. Okay, moving on. See? We're almost done. See, we're not, I, I'm not a, I am a long-winded talker, but not tonight. Okay. Finally, it says, he has spoken through the prophets. And so, the Word of God, which becomes Jesus Christ when he becomes flesh, but in the Old Testament, it's the Word of God. You know, whenever God speaks, like with Samuel, right? And Samuel's like, he's the little apprentice, and then he hears his name, someone goes, Samuel, right? And then, the guy, and then he, he goes to his master and says, did you call me? And the guy's asleep, and he's like, I didn't call you, go away. And he goes, okay. 
And then he, and then he hears, Samuel! And so then he comes back and he goes, did you call me? And he goes, I told you, I didn't call you, go away. So then he goes, Samuel! And he comes back a third time and wakes the guy up again. And this guy's an old man. And he says, did you call me? And he goes, next time that you hear this, you know, say, Lord, you know, speak to me because your servant is listening. So then he hears again, he goes, Samuel, and he goes, Lord, speak to me, your servant is listening. And all of a sudden, God starts speaking. All right? Whose idea was it to call Samuel? God the Father. Who's speaking? God the Son. But who's engaging Samuel to respond to that call is the Holy Spirit. Because ultimately, what we do, what the prophets did, you know, like Jonah. Jonah wasn't listening to the Holy Spirit when he ran away and then got eaten by that whale. All right? But then when he finally goes, he's listening to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will dog you. I mean, he won't leave you alone. But that happens with us too. Is that each time that we want to sin and you have that little voice in your head that says, hey, don't do it. You know? That's the Holy Spirit, you know? Or if you're like about this, and okay, I'm going to be very personal here for a second because this happens to me all the time. I don't know if I just have a funky relationship with God, but this happens to me. Like I'll be about to do something like wrong. I don't know. Let's pick something that's fictional because I don't want to like use this as confession time. Um, all right. So let's say that I'm in the store and I'm about to like, you know, steal a Tootsie Roll, because I like Tootsie Rolls, they're delicious. All right, so I'm about to, like, take it. All of a sudden, like, someone walks up to me and goes, hey, Nick, how you doing? And I'm like, oh, hey, how are you? All right, the person who stopped me from taking that or put that person over here to say hey to me was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit directs people to sort of stay away from the evil side and stay on the path, you know, stay on the yellow brick road to get yourself to heaven, all right? Are we cool? We're cool? All right. Now, this, I love this picture. This is by Raphael, the, the man who had no name, last name. And uh, this is in the Vatican. And it's so funny because at the bottom, in the center, you have an altar with the Holy Eucharist on it. And then you have all these bishops and popes and lay people and philosophers all arguing whether it's the real presence or not. They're all saying, is this really Jesus? Is this really Jesus? And someone's going, yeah, it is. And someone's going, no, it's not. And then up in heaven, you have like the Trinity, and then you have all these prophets, like there's Moses, and there's Elijah, and Isaiah, and there's John the Baptist, and they're all sort of sitting there like pointing towards Jesus. It's actually kind of comical, because everybody in heaven's kind of like, yeah, well, we know what it is. Like, why can't you dummies figure it out? Which is actually really funny. See? Great art. Go to the Vatican. Take Father Justin, because he, no, he used to give tours, not because I want him out of town. Although... <laughs> but no, he used to give tours of the place, so I'm sure like, it's, it's amazing if you go. Okay. And look, it's picture time. See, this is how easy I am. It's picture time. All right, so who has the Holy Spirit inspired? Well, I guess you have to say everybody. But here are some of his better achievements, I suppose, is, is a good way to put it. So here we've got Jesus, and then we have the four evangelists, which I don't know which is the one that's sort of hiding in the back behind this other guy on the right, but they're the four evangelists. The Holy Spirit's the one who inspires them to write the Gospels, you know? Like Luke's sitting there going, man, I want to I wanna write this Jesus thing down. And he goes, but I don't know, should I write this Jesus thing down? And then the Holy Spirit says, yeah, you should do it. And then he goes, okay, let's do it. And then it's the Holy Spirit who says, you know, hey, erase that last part. That wasn't exactly true. And he says, oh, okay. Well, it wasn't that intimate. But still, like the Holy Spirit's guiding the writing of Scripture. Okay, so that's good for, the, good for him. Let's see. Ah, Pentecost. This one I, I sort of almost didn't want to put in because there are a lot more people than like 12. I thought, well, I'm, I don't know, maybe one of the servant girls got hit by the Holy Spirit too. I don't know. But... Uh, but there you go, see, that's Pentecost. You got Virgin Mary there. She's center stage, and then... Oh, okay, I thought the thing was going to break for a second. And then you have all of the, uh, all the soon-to-be apostles, and this one's over here. <laughs> I'm sorry, this one over here. You see the guy in the red in the, on the right side? And he looks like his hair's on fire, because he looks like he's about to, like, you know, stop, drop, and roll. I love that one. I don't know, if you want to see these up close and personal, you can, because they're kind of blurry up there, but it's actually really funny. Uh, let's see. Ah, oh, this is a good one. Who does the Holy Spirit talk to on a daily basis besides everybody here? But in a more intimate way is the Pope. It's the Pope. Because we believe as Catholics, and this is dogma, so I mean, if you're going to become a Catholic, you have to believe this, that 
because the Pope teaches on faith and morals, when he does so, he does it infallibly. Right? When he sits in his chair and he says, this is what everyone's going to believe, it's the truth. Even if the majority of people think that it sounds kind of weird. Like he could theoretically sit on his chair and say it's a matter of faith and morals that everybody wear a hat to church. Now he wouldn't do that because that would be ridiculous and we'd think that he had lost his mind. But theoretically, if he did that, it would be, you know, dogma. Although we'd probably argue with him about that. But the Holy Spirit comes and talks to him and makes sure that what he's, how he's guiding the church is in the direction that God, you know, Jesus Christ wants it because it's the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to get his church to where it needs to be. Now this is Gregory the Great. He was Gregory the First. And uh, they always show him, this is the nicest picture that I could find, but they always kind of show him like, with like the Holy Spirit like on his shoulder in his ear, like kind of whispering to him or, I don't know, whatever he's doing with his ear. But, uh, but yeah, so that's good for him. And that's his papal tiara. They don't wear that anymore. But it's not like they like, stopped wearing it like hundreds of years ago. They stopped wearing it like 50 years ago. So, but they used to. Okay. And th this is the last one. And how great is this one? That one was a pretty good, you know, Holy Spirit moment, right? Because in the Creed, it also says, you know, she conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Like the reason we have Jesus Christ in the flesh is because Mary said yes. And because the Holy Spirit, you know, came down and made sure that Jesus Christ got put in her womb. So, yeah, thank you, Holy Spirit. Let's not just thank Jesus for coming. See, it's Christmas. So let's not just thank Jesus for being born. Holy Spirit helped. And questions? Yes, yeah, Zach? Yeah, I know. I need a drink, too. Okay. The, uh, the part that got me confused was when he said that the uh, baptism performed by John the Baptist was null and void, basically. That other um, if when you when you said that immediately, I thought of you know God breathing into the clay figure and breathing in the Holy Spirit. So you know, after generations, you know, technically uh, John the Baptist wrapped to Adam and Eve and all that. Right. My way of thinking. So technically, in my opinion, he's already had the Holy Spirit inside of him. So. Because baptizing people was him in the Holy Spirit. But the problem was he wasn't baptizing them in the Holy Spirit. And he even says he's not in the Bible. No, it's inside of him. Right. Like the thing that the Holy Spirit that's inside of him is giving him life. And, you know, enabling him to do this and to do this and to, I don't know, maybe he was a, like a minister. He was doing this. Yeah. All right. But when he's baptizing them, he's baptizing them in water for the repentance of their sins. But he's not baptizing them in water and the Holy Spirit's not coming down from heaven upon that person and, and saving their soul and putting that indelible mark on their soul that says, hey, you belong to Jesus. Because it's only with Jesus that that starts to happen. And when, when God breathed into them and gave them the Spirit, then they committed original sin and were kicked out of the garden. So when God... When the Spirit came originally, they had no sin. They were in paradise. They were in the garden. They sinned, willingly, got kicked out. And then when John the Baptist came along, he was, it was... Uh, forgiving. Them. Forgiven, yeah. When Jesus came along, it was a forgiving of their sin. Right? Yeah. I'm sorry. And then John the Baptist was just like sort of laying the groundwork okay. so that when Jesus Christ goes, let's get all these people baptized, everyone goes, why the heck does he want to dunk us in water? Like, because it was actually kind of at the time of Jesus, it was actually really popular to sort of go to the river and get yourself dunked, I guess. It's a weird way of saying it. But yeah. So, yeah. Oh. So we got to go back a little bit. For what? Why do we have to well, go back? Because baptism by water, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, if it's the person's first time on earth, it removes whatever sin they happen to have. Right. 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 Okay. So what part about that is not valid? About baptizing somebody with water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? What part about that is invalid? None of it. But John the Baptist isn't baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's just baptizing them in water. He's just dunking them in water and saying, okay, good job. 
But he's not like saying, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But Jesus Christ commands at the end of the Gospels, he commands them, he says, go out to all the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the, where the baptism with Jesus comes in. I think you're getting into a bit of a specious argument here because according to Matthew 3, the baptism for John for repentance was a valid baptism for repentance. So when you ask your question, which is valid and which is not, that's not a really a good question because Matthew's gospel specifically for repentance, not for salvation. And that's where we have to make the distinction in baptism. Okay. Not over whether or not one is valid for its purpose. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, question me here. This passes up. These have nothing, I didn't make those questions. Yes? Go back over because now you just went to seminary here, so I'm going to pick a brain. Okay, I like Jesus. I know you like Jesus. Jesus was also baptized by John the Baptist, but Jesus had no sin. And I don't know Father Allen touched on this, but I can't uh -huh. remember exactly what he said. Mm. I think something about to set an example. Um, so that's one thing. Um, Pope Benedict, Pope Benedict, you know, in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, actually comes up with the argument, which is a very compelling one, I think, that Jesus, you know, everybody's been being baptized in the water. When Jesus gets baptized, it's sort of like, as opposed to it washing away any sins that he has, it actually sucks up everybody's sins. So that's why when you're baptized... In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're being baptized into the baptism of Jesus. So that your sins sort of cosmically get put, get taken away from you, dumped into the Jordan River 2,000 years ago, and get sucked into Jesus. And I said it like less eloquent than the Pope, but um, one, one, um, one theologian said that the baptism in the Jordan for Jesus makes him a sin eater. That his body sort of eats up the sin, that, so that when he's crucified, he has the sins of the world on him, and that's how they get forgiven. Because, here we go, Paul. Okay, we'll get into it, Jenny. So, because at, at Yom Kippur, you know, the day of atonement, the high priest takes the unblemished lamb, and he go and he turns to the people of Israel, and he collects their sins. He, actually, like, he does kind of like this. He collects their sins, and then he takes his hands and he places them on the lamb. So, because in ancient Israel, see, today we kind of think of our sins as like, you know, I hit somebody with my car. Well, that's my sin because I drove down my neighbor. But back in ancient Israel, sins were transferable, which is why you could blame, which is why it's actually, you know, that's why we have original sin because it gets transferred from generation to generation. So they would transfer the sins of Israel onto the lamb. So with his baptism, Jesus is beginning <coughs> to suck up all the sins of Israel and the world. And then when he goes to people, and he goes to people, and he says, you know, like to the blind man, he says, your sins are forgiven. He's sort of taking that sin upon himself. He's transferring it because he's the lamb. So he's transferring it. And he goes, that's why he, he sort of covers a lot of territory. It's not like he just hangs around in Jerusalem where all the priests are. And he says, you know, hey, everybody, you know, if I can just convince you guys that I'm the son of God, everything will be cool. But he tries to cover as much territory as possible. That's why he goes into places like Samaria, which were at one time part of Israel, but, you know, had separated because of theological differences. So he tries to cover as much territory as possible in order to sort of get as many sins as possible. I know that's kind of weird, but that's what Pope Benedict argues, and he's the Pope. But go back now. Okay. John baptized Jesus. And yes. The Holy Spirit came because God sent the Holy Spirit. Yes. And Jesus was baptized. Yes. It's not because John the Baptist wanted the Holy Spirit to come. God sent the Holy Spirit. Right. So after that, did John baptize more people, and was the Holy Spirit present then? Well, whether he baptized more people, uh, I believe he did, but then in Acts, as I said, they, the apostle said, well, you need to be, you need to be baptized in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because I don't think that John, I don't think that Jesus looked at his cousin John the Baptist after the baptism and said, now baptize everybody in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have another question. Technically, when I was in nursing school, I was taught 
because some people are Catholic and their babies are born and their babies are going to die. Anybody can baptize, and I was taught to baptize babies that were going to die. A priest was not available. So if a person, not a priest, baptizes a dying infant, are they baptized also with the Holy Spirit? Yes, because you're baptized. As long as you pour water and have, or immerse in the water, but with the baby, don't immerse in the water. That's no. a tricky situation. Just pour some water, and you baptize them in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you baptize, if you go, I baptize you in the name of Jesus, that's not a baptism. You have to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then they're baptized. What's important about baptism, oh, man, we're going to get into the catechism. This is awesome. All right, the catechism says anybody can baptize as long as they do three things. Number one, they pour or immerse in water, pure water. I mean, we're not talking, you know, sparkling water. We're not talking like Coca-Cola, because the first ingredient is water, all right? Club soda, it needs to be pure water, like no bubbles, all right? Secondly, so you can't use mud. Trust me, people try this stuff, like funky people. But it doesn't have to be holy water. No, no, it can just be regular water, like from the tap, get yourself a glass tap water. You have to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you have to have the intention that that person becomes a Christian. Okay? What is not required is the intention of that person to become a Christian. And that's important because in, when the settlers first came to the New World, they were sort of forcibly, you know, baptizing all the Mexicans. And the church at the time agreed with it and said, yeah, make them Christians. Nowadays, you say, no, 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 maybe we want them to ask for it. You know, like we don't go around making, just baptizing everybody. And say, ah, you're all Catholics now, suckers. You know? <laughs> Now, the thing is that the church says, say, I don't know, there's a Buddhist in the middle of Tibet. And he, and he got his hands on a Bible. And he really wants to become a Christian. And the only person he lives with is like his Muslim neighbor. The Muslim neighbor could baptize the, that, the Buddhist, a Christian, as long as he poured the water and said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and had the intention that he were to become a Christian. Now, he'd probably be a really bad Muslim, but the church would say that that's valid. Now, do we want like, all the Buddhists in Tibet to go around baptizing each other? No. Like We'd say, wait for a priest or a missionary or somebody. But yes, at the hospital, if, if the priest ain't going to make it, feel free. My mother's a, a pediatric intensive care nurse, and she carries, um, she carries holy water with her in her jacket, but you know, you can just use regular water. But and she's had to do that twice. So that's how I know, because she was like freaking out. She was like, the baby was baptized, right? And I was like, yes, ma'am. She said, okay. Can I ask you Sure. The purpose of John baptizing, as it says, as um, Zachariah says when Zachariah, when John the Baptist is finally born, Zachariah, his father, who wasn't allowed to speak because he didn't think that his wife could become pregnant, he's finally allowed to speak. And, when, and the thing he says, he goes through this whole like thing. But one of the things he says is, he says to John the Baptist, You, my child, will become a prophet of the Most High, and you will prepare the way. That's the thing. John the Baptist even says about himself, he says, I am not the Messiah. I am preparing the way for him. So the point of John the Baptist was to lay the groundwork so that when Jesus Christ comes, people weren't so sort of like, where the heck is this guy coming from? That's the point, because he was the last prophet, and so he was he was doing God's work by laying the groundwork, sort of you know tilling the fields, getting it ready. And actually, at the time of Jesus, the uh, Jewish people were very, very, very on edge because they were convinced that the Messiah was coming, which is why a lot of people didn't believe Jesus because they had already executed a number of people. It's in the history books, in the Jewish histories, that they had already executed a number of people for claiming to be the Messiah. And after Jesus, they actually executed a couple more who claimed to be the Messiah. And so for the Jewish people, they said, oh, well, Jesus is just one of these, you know, non-Messiah fakers. But for the Christians, they said, no, he rose again. You know, he rose from the dead, so clearly he's the Messiah. 